Gresham College presents Cary Grant, Hollywood's Exquisite Charming Enigma by Geoffrey Wonsall. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Michael Minelli. I'm one of the fellows and trustees of Gresham College, and it's my delight, firstly, to welcome you to Gresham College this evening, uh, but also the privilege to introduce the lecturer and our speaker this evening, Geoffrey Wonsall. Everyone wants to be Cary Grant. Even I want to be Cary Grant, said Archibald Alexander Leach, an English-American actor better known by his stage name, Cary Grant. With his transatlantic accent, debonair demeanor, and dashing good looks, Grant is considered one of classic Hollywood's definitive leading men. As a professor of commerce, it's gratifying to know that, unlike many cinematic poseurs, Grant was aware of his craft's commercial roots. We have our factory, which is called a stage. We make a product, we color it, we title it, and we ship it out in cans. Jeffrey Wansel was introduced to Gresham College by one of Gresham College's dearest friends, David Vermont. Jeffrey has published two biographies on Grant, as well as several other books, including biographies of playwright Terence Rattigan and tycoon James Goldsmith, a history of the Garrick Club, as well as two factual crime books, one on Frederick West, the serial killer, and a second, just out last year, The Bus Stop Killer, about Millie Dowler's murderer. Jeffrey reads hundreds of thrillers a year as one of the country's leading reviewers, I'm still following his five-point program for a thriller of my own. A protagonist you like, speed, locale, and knowledgeable details, but most of all, an excellent villain. And does, us bring, does that bring us back to Cary Grant? Because Cary Grant also said, I pretended to be somebody I wanted to be, and I finally became that person. Or he became me. Or we met at some point. Now, Jeffrey Wansel, with his many investigative, investigative skills, will help us all look behind the engaging yet enigmatic mask Cary Grant presented to the world. Jeffrey. Thanks, Michael. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to post-Jubilee London. I'd like to take you back after all those celebrations to a time even before the accession of Elizabeth I'm going to take you back to the dream factory, the days when, well, Hollywood was golden and it was always in black and white somehow, and it just seemed more beautiful and more exciting. A little formal introduction and then we'll get on to the more exciting things like the movies. You're not going to get away, I'm afraid, without seeing several movies of Cary Grant. Um, I mean, to millions and millions of cinema goers around the world, he'll be ever remembered for his glamour and his style and his dark hair and even darker eyes and that mischievous smile and that effortless elegance and that wit and that charm. Since his death in 1986, at the age of 82, the incandescence of that image has not dimmed for a moment. Uh, the actor Burt Reynolds once put it very well, he was touched by the gods, he said. When he walked into a room, you had to look at him. Men liked him as well as women, and that's a rare thing. Certainly, if the women in his audience were hypnotized, their male partners were never for one moment threatened. They only wished they could match his ageless, apparently effortless appeal. Steve Lawrence, the actor, once summed it up by saying, when Kerry walked into the room, not only did the woman primp, but the men straightened their ties. And it was entirely true. The American Film Institute recently conducted a survey of the greatest male movie actors of all time. And Grant came second. Only Marlon Brando got more votes. And just think what that means. Think of the people who were left behind him. Jimmy Stewart, Robert Mitchum, Robert De Niro, Burt Lancaster, Spencer Tracy, Humphrey Bogart. Goodness me, the list is absolutely endless. And it was the director, it was directors, uh, people like John Milius or Billy Wilder or Jeremy Thomas or Nick Powell or Stephen Frears who elected him. 
It wasn't the general public, these were the professionals in the, in the, uh, in the business. And Carey was, perhaps more than anyone, the consummate professional. He made five films with Howard Hawks, four with Hitchcock, who called him his favourite leading man. In fact, he once said, he's the only actor I ever fell in love with. Uh, and for Hitchcock, that was rare. He fell in love with the women, but not the men. Um, he made four with Leo McCary, three with Stanley Doan and George Cukor. He was... Well, they organised... They, they, something about Carey, they recognised his extraordinary charm. That, that moment when he looked at the camera, when you thought no one looks at the camera like that. No one is more brilliant. And yet, and yet, so enigmatic. Everybody wanted to have him. Uh, Mae West, whom we will see in a moment, said, why don't you come up sometime and see me? Um, Sherrard, uh, Audrey Hepburn says, I don't bite unless it's called for. Every woman seemed to want to possess him, but they never quite could. And that was one of the unmistakable, elusive things that made him such an extraordinary star. That disarming smile, that mannered charm, but there was all something going on behind it. And it was what was going on behind it, I think, that makes him truly, truly interesting. It was Hitchcock who really got to the bottom of that. I mean, I think Hitch once said, there's a frightening side to Carey that no one can quite put their finger on. And I'm going to show you a little bit of that tonight. A little bit of the frightening side of him. That didn't detract from his charm, not at all. It didn't detract from his ability to do comedy, not for a second. But what it did do was it made him hard to pin down. Now, I've said that he was one of the movie industry's biggest stars, the second greatest male lead of all time. But let's just remember what he, how big a star he would have been if, for example, he'd taken Frank Capra's offer to do It's a Wonderful Life, if he'd played Monty Woolley's part in The Man Who Came to Dinner, if he'd taken... Gregory Peck's part in Beloved Infidel, Ronnie Coleman's in The Double Life, Gary Cooper's in Love in the Afternoon, James Stewart's in Hitchcock's Rope, David Niven's role in Around the World in 80 Days, uh, Bill Holden's role in The Bridge on the River Kwai, and, of course, James Bond. He turned down every single one of them. He would have been, without question, bigger than Brando, had he taken even half dozen of those or four. But in the end he said uh, he turned down Rex Harrison's part in My Fair Lady saying Rex, I'd only be thought of as Rex Harrison and insisted that Robert Preston played the music man. This is a man who you might say was reluctant <laughs> to be a star but a star he nevertheless was. But all the way through that time he was also a troubled actor. He was troubled by as I'll say, his childhood, by his relationship with women, by his insecurity, and by the fact that he'd never quite felt that he deserved the acclaim that he had. And a lot of that is, you can see in some of the performances I'm going to show you. Um, but never once, never once, in 72 films over 33 years, was he ever anything less than the fussy, determined perfectionist that someone once called the happy warrior. He was not an easy man always to work with, no matter how he may have appeared on the screen. But I think Tom Wolfe put it very nicely when he said, to women, he's the Hollywood's lone exa example of the sexy gentleman. And to men and women, he's Hollywood's lone star, that most romantic of all things, the romantic bourgeois hero. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about tonight. I met him in 1978. I got a phone call. I was at The Observer, writing a column called Pendennis, which still exists, I'm amazed to say. Uh, and the phone rang one day and they said, would you like to interview Cary Grant? Now, there's no person on the planet who would not want to interview Cary Grant. And they said, fine, come tomorrow morning to um, this rather remote flat behind the Hilton Hotel and uh, ask for Margaret. Oh, well, that's fairly strange. So it's a very bright February morning. 
brilliant blue sky, and I ring the doorbell, and this unmistakable voice says, hello, and I say, is Margaret there? He says, yes, yes, come up. <laughs> so I said, okay, yeah, that's right. So I go up, and there, in his all his splendid, you know, by then snowy-haired glory, was Cary Grant. And it was, funnily enough, it was by complete coincidence the day that Mae West had died. And so I said, thinking one has to say, what can you say to Cary Grant? I said, you must be very you know, sad about Mae West's death. He said, do you want coffee? <laughs> I said, no, I mean, she died overnight. He said, tea? <laughs> the one thing he would never do, ever, was talk about his performances or his co-stars. In fact, if he could avoid it, he wouldn't talk about movies at all. What he did enjoy talking about was being an acrobat because he started in music hall. And as I left that extraordinary stuffy little flat near Shepherd's Market that day, I thought, I've never seen anyone describe this movie star in the way he truly is, which is extraordinary, elusive, and he was being looked after by the, the woman who was to come, become his fifth wife, Barbara Harris, who was the press officer of the Royal Lancaster Hotel. Um, but he was really being looked after. So I went away and I thought, I'll write a book about him. So I wrote to him. No, I don't want you to do it. No, 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 no. No, no we'll talk to you. No, no, no. So I said, oh, okay. So I go to Hollywood. I take my family to Hollywood. We're so poor, we swap houses. It's, it's terrible. And there he is. And we have this phone conversation. Oh, yeah, okay. Jimmy Stewart's going to talk to you. Oh, that's great. And I've told Doris Day. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, no. And he would drive past where I was living in a blacked out limo, because I used to sit in the window typing to see if I was really there, to see if I was really working. And the more, I, the more that happened, the more convinced I was that this was a quite, quite extraordinary man. So let's go back to the beginning. We all know, born in Bristol, Archibald Alexander Leach, January 1904, uh, son of a trouser presser and a very unhappy woman. His mother, Elsie, probably coloured his life forever. She was a Victorian through and through. She was very unhappy. She'd lost a child after one year who died of pneumonia suddenly in 1901. Carey wasn't born until three years later. And when Carey arrived, I think she simply smothered him. Uh, her husband, Elias, was a neat, quiet little man who, after about six years of this, got fed up with both his wife and, I think, with Carey, who was then, of course, called Archie, and decided to set off and live with another woman whom he'd found in Southampton. That didn't last very long, so he, he crept back to the family home. But when Leach, Archie Leach was ten, his dad sent his mother to Fishpond's mental institution without telling his son. Didn't tell him. On, he went to school in an ordinary way. Men came at 11 o'clock, disappeared. When he came back, she wasn't there. He wasn't to see her again for 20 years. In fact, he once said, I was better known by the world than I was by my own mother. And it had an incredible impact on this incandescent figure. He never quite recovered. He became a Boy Scout. He f discovered the one place that he was happy, which was backstage in the Bristol Hippodrome. Uh, he got a job with Bob Pender's troupe, which was stilt walkers in 1914, when he was still 13. He forged a letter from his father, got a job, then his father found out, he got him back, but he still went back to Pender. Pender looked after him, he became, in fact his obituary says, and I think it was a wonderful obituary in the New York Times, said he's the acrobat of the drawing room. He brought the skills he learnt in vaudeville and in musical to the, to the screen. He goes to America with Pender. They tour for nearly two years. Doesn't say a word. He's not spoken a word at this point. He's still a stilt walker and an acrobat. Pender goes home and Archie Leach decides to stay. He forms a, a stilt walking act, partly on Coney Island, with Pender's son Tommy. And very quickly, they play the palace, which is regarded as the, you know, the greatest thing in the vaudeville calendar. And someone says to him, you know, you could do more than this. You, can you sing? Well, he could sing a bit, not very well, but he found himself suddenly starring in light opera. 
The light opera led to slightly more serious musicals, particularly the famous musical called Nicky, which he played in St. Louis for nearly a year. And in Nicky, he played a man called Carey Lockwood. So, it's now 1930, 1931. Uh, the Wall Street Cash has happened, entertainment's still working. He and a friend, well, it was in fact Ori Kelly, the theatre designer, the stage designer, who may or may not have been his lover, we'll get back to that, um, said to him, why don't you go to Hollywood? And he and a friend called Phil Charig got in a Packard convertible and drove from New York to Hollywood. It was then, because there were a couple of people who knew him, Billy Morris at the William Morris Agency, and a couple of people who knew him, they introduced him to B.P. Schulberg, who was the head of Paramount. Now, at that moment, Paramount was in a problem. Gary Cooper had done a runner. Gary Cooper was Paramount's biggest star. He decided he was going, to, he was going on a safari with Lupe Velez. Those of you of older generations will remember who Lupe Velez was. The Mexican Spitfire, always regarded as the hottest woman in Hollywood. She died very young, unfortunately. Um, Cooper was off, so Schulberg was looking for a new young man and discovers this rather handsome young man called Cary Grant. So they decide he has to have a new name. Schulberg said, you can't have that name. Archie Leach doesn't work. So, okay, you can be Cary. Well, Grant said, what about Cary Lockwood? So, no, you can't have Cary Lockwood. Too many Lockwoods. You can, so they gave him a list of US presidents. So he chose Grant. Um, he became, for $450 a week, not a small amount of money, a contract star with Paramount. And they put him in ugh, pretty awful stuff. And he wasn't very good. I'm going to show you a little clip, however, of the fact that the audience liked him. And in particular, Mae West liked him. Those of you who don't remember Mae West, she was a force of nature. Um, this is a film uh, in which he plays the, the love interest, and she is a lion tamer. You have to suspend your disbelief this evening, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> she is a lion tamer, and uh, the film was called I'm No Angel, and what's interesting is that it helped to save Paramount from bankruptcy. This and the pre its pre predecessor, she done him wrong, another Mae West, Cary Grant picture, uh, saved Paramount from the bailiffs. So let's just have a little look at I'm No Angel. Hello, honey. Keep Miss Tara. Oh, uh, if anyone should call, I'm indisposed. Yes, ma'am. You know what I mean, don't you? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Come here, dear. I haven't had you alone all evening with all those people. Well, my public. <laughs> <laughs> Let me take a good look at you. Ah, oh, you were wonderful tonight. I'm always wonderful at night. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but tonight you were especially good. Well, when I'm good, I'm very good. But when I'm bad, I'm better. <laughs> oh, uh, don't go away. I'll be right back. No one loves me like that New York man. You must have had a good time. You seem so happy. If I wasn't, you'd know it. Oh, uh, get me another gown, Beulah. I danced this one around all evening. I gotta give it a rest. Yes, ma'am. Which one? Oh, that lucky one. Yes. Trust you. Oh, you can. Hundreds have. <laughs> you know I'm mad about you. I can tell you'd be the first time I saw you. 
<laughs> Say, I must be transparent. Honey, you're just wrapped in cellophane. <laughs> well, I think that's arguably the worst performance I've ever seen. Um, <laughs> he was so wooden, so, so bad, that it's almost impossible to imagine what he became. But nevertheless, Mae West, and incidentally Dietrich in Blonde Venus, gave him a confidence that he, he kind of took to heart. Now, remember, this is 1934, nearly 80 years ago. And life was a lot different then. And he was earning, at this point, $750 a week. Not a small amount for a, an actor, and certainly not a small amount in Depression America. But what happened, and I think it's interesting, is that he, he got confidence from that performance, and indeed from She Done Him Wrong. And he also decided, after having worked with Dietrich, that he would look at the lighting and he would be, try and be a perfectionist. In the next three years, he transformed his career. He moved in with Randolph Scott. Uh, I won't try and describe Randolph Scott. Anybody who's seen a Bud Bertica movie knows who Randolph Scott is. Uh, very, very handsome young man. Um, they lived in together for 12 years. Um, uh, Grant said later, my first two wives insisted I was homosexual. Um, well, let's put it this way. He certainly wasn't entirely heterosexual. Um, uh, But Randolph Scott and he had this sort of bachelor's hall, as it was called by Luella Parsons. And the two of them entertained, and they were very happy together, and, it was, and confidence started to imbue. He started to forget. The only difficult thing was that his father wrote to him shortly after this film was made and say, to tell him that his mother had come out of hospital. And he took Virginia Cheryl, who was his first wife, who'd starred in City Lights with Chaplin, back to see her. And she, he married her the following day in Caxton Hall, a marriage that lasted 15 months. A Kerry liked to marry, but I don't really think he understood what it meant. He married a lot, as you all know, five times. Um, but what did happen, I mean, Virginia Cheryl had to move in with Randolph Scott and he. I mean, they didn't take a house together. Oh, no, no, she, she, got rather up, she was rather upset by that. I can't imagine why. Um, but what happened was he suddenly ran into a number of people who saw what there was there and could make it. One of them was a man called Leo McCary, and I'll come back to him in a moment, a marvellous director. Um, and one was Howard Hawks. Howard Hawks had worked with Howard Hughes, whom Randolph Scott had introduced Cary Grant to. Howard Hughes being, I, I don't let's go back over the Howard Hughes myths, but you know we can all uh, remember them. Uh, Hughes had a project. He'd found it as a play for his then inamorata. He was always romancing beautiful women, Catherine Hepburn. And he wanted to make it a movie. And the movie was about an heiress, an airhead heiress, and a paleontologist. And Here's the first time you really see just how good Grant was. It's called Bringing Up Baby. You lied to me. No, well, I did just Tell me a ridiculous bit. story no, about a leopard. No, it wasn't a ridiculous story. I have a leopard. Well, where is the right leopard? Right in there. I don't believe you, Susan. But you have to believe me. I've been the absolute victim truth. of your unbridled imagination once more. Jane. All the way you talk about. <laughs> That'll teach you to go around saying things about people. Susan, you've got to get out of this apartment. But, David, I can't. I have a lease. Oh, it isn't that. You've got to get this thing out of here. Don't worry about I'll him. He's it. really all right. What are you going to do? I'm going to call the zoo. Oh, no, you can't do that, David. Oh, that's the meanest thing I ever heard. He's a pet. He'd be miserable in a zoo. Listen, oh, from my brother Mark from Brazil. Dear Susan, I'm sending you baby. That's baby. Uh, leopard I picked up. Guard him with your life. He's three years old, gentle as a kitten, and he likes dogs. 
Well, I don't know whether Mark means that he eats dogs or is fond of them. Mark's so vague at times. Vague. He also likes music, particularly that song, I Can't Give You Anything But Love. Baby. Oh, that's absurd. No, it isn't, David. Really, listen. This is probably the silliest thing that ever happened to me. I know it's silly, but it's true. He absolutely adores the tune. Well, what's the difference whether it adores the tune? It's funny that he should like such an old tune, isn't it? But I imagine that down in Brazil they probably... Listen. Oh, stop it, Susan. Oh, stop. David, let me show you. Oh, don't do that, Susan. Don't go near the door. No, but... Oh, oh dear, dear, dear. Oh. Now watch, David. You'll see he'll go right toward the music. Look at that. Isn't this remarkable? It loves it, eh? Susan. If we put the Victrola in the bathroom, will it go back in? Oh, yes, but the music sounds better out here, and besides, he likes it. Oh, here it comes. Oh, now go away. Go, oh, please, go away. Oh, my, go away. I'm going to get out of here. Oh. Uh, the interesting thing is that Grant hated that leopard, who was actually called Nisa. And in fact, the scene where the leopard bites his trousers, he made his double do. He really loathed the animal. Hepburn, on the other hand, adored it and thought it was wonderful. Nevertheless, bringing up baby effectively uh, created what became the perfect zany. I think Bo Peter Bogdanovich called him the perfect zany. Uh, a man who could do comedy with perfect timing and at the same time be attractive. And very shortly, he, he began to make, he made a set of movies along those lines. But he was never entirely completely happy. Virginia Cheryl, when she divorced him in 1935, um, had made a series of very violent criticisms of him in her divorce papers, alleging that he'd beat her and choked her and uh, mentally abused her. And those, those accusations were to dog his entire career through a, from a variety of women, many of whom he married. But nevertheless, when you saw him on the screen, and that's what I meant about the Dream Factory, we are talking about someone who, you know, in the only way he could say, lit up the screen. I mean, he was paid $112,500 for making Bringing Out Baby, 1937. Think what that would be worth today. Um, he went on to make a string of hits, literally a string. Holiday with Philip Barrett, also with Hepburn. Ganga Din with Doug Fairbanks Jr. Only Angels Have Wings uh, with Rita Hayworth, the young Rita Hayworth, who was called Judy in the movies, hence the famous, uh, you know, uh, mimic, everybody going, Kerry Grant going, Judy, 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 it was actually Rita Hayworth. And he, he became a, still living with Randolph Scott, still this fastidious, Increasingly perfectionist. On the way over from um, England to America when he went in 1920, he'd seen Doug Fairbanks and Mary Pickford on the Olympic. They were, of course, in first class and he was in steerage. But, and he was very struck by Fairbanks' tan and the fact that he was very well mannered. And so Kerry set out to get himself a tan, which is now, you know, everybody remembers. Kerry Grant has even a bit greater tan than Simon Cowell. Um, he, he made time after time an attempt to give you the sense that there was something else going on, something behind the mask. And there's no... He made a second film with Leo McCary after Awful Truth, which helped to cement the success of Bring Out Baby. Um, and this one was called My Favourite Wife. Um, essentially, he's been married to Irene Dunn, uh, but she disappeared on a, for, uh, on a Pacific island for seven years for an affair with Randolph Scott. Some surprise there, then. Uh, and she comes back just as he's about to marry again. In fact, the very day, he's always getting married in these movies. Yeah, it's, it's true. Um, every single time he's getting married. Anyway, she comes back the very day, and um, she's obviously not too pleased that her husband is um, marrying someone else, and what's more, she's becoming the stepmother to her children. So let's have a look at um, my favourite wife. Let's try something like this. Um, I'll be, um, what was that name? Bianca? Bianca. <laughs> All right. I'm Bianca. Now, you come in. Come on, come in. You come in. All right, I'm in. Yes. Now, uh, say something. 
Hello, Bianca. Oh, that's good. Now, she'll say, um, hello, darling. Really, you've been a terribly long time. She doesn't talk like oh, that. Oh, what's the difference? And then she'll say, darling, aren't you going to kiss me? Well, come on. Well, come on. Well, this is well do silly, it, do it, do it anyway. Oh, uh, all right. Do it. No, I mean, do it from the beginning. Go out and come in again. If you're going to do it right, you may as well. Mm, all right, I'll play it. I'll make you happy. Yeah. Come on. Now, you're in. I'm in again. And then you say, hello, hello Bianca. Bianca. And I say, hello, darling. You Aren't you going to all kiss right. me? Uh-huh. Was that for Bianca? I don't think anyone's done that better. Irene Dunn was incandescent, wasn't she? Absolutely stunning. But he made her look good. He didn't overplay. He didn't steal the limelight. He didn't try and mug. He did what he did with incredible grace and extraordinary charm. And it's performances like that that stick in all our memories, the reason that we prize him as much as we do, the reason that he was and is still treasured. But sadly, at the same time, he was unhappy. Uh, he'd started a relationship with an actress called Phyllis Brooks, which hadn't gone very well. He's still living with Randy Scott, of course. They, by this time, bought a beach house in Santa Monica as well as the one in West Live Oak Drive in the hills above the Hollywood, just beneath the Hollywood side. And he, nothing really seemed to work. He was always complaining. He worked with directors. He was always fussing about something. And yet when the camera turned, although he drove some directors to, dis, some directors to distraction, the camera turned something quite magical happened. Unfortunately, I don't have a clip from the Philadelphia story. I would love to have one, but unfortunately I couldn't find one. Uh, this again, I think, is a movie that none of us can forget. He played C.K. Dexter Haven, the ex-wife of Catherine Hepburn, and James Stewart played the reporter who comes to report this society wedding. And of course, everyone wants Catherine Hepburn to marry Cary Grant again. How could you not? May, remade, of course, in the movie, uh, the musical High Society. Um, but it, 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 in, it absolutely captures those moments in 1940 and 1941 that were unforgettable. And in the midst of the war, Cary hadn't joined up. He'd, uh, he wanted to volunteer for the American Air Force. Uh, but finally, the American government wouldn't allow him to because they said he was too valuable to them as an actor. And in fact, he did tours for the troops. Um, David Niven, by contrast, had gone back after his success and gone straight back to Britain and joined up, as we all know, and served in the commandos. But Grant didn't. Um, some, there were some people in Britain who were uncomfortable about that. Um, but. He, had, he was about to take American citizenship because he'd met the heiress Barbara Hutton, the Woolworths heiress, who inherited $5 million when she was the age of five. And they had become a couple. Um, he, this poor boy from Bristol, and she, you know, literally American royalty, um, he decided he wanted to marry her. And she wouldn't allow him to remain an English citizen for fear of her son, Lance Reventlow, um, being taken back to England. So he became an American. And I think, I think you could say he liked it. I think he enjoyed it. Um, but I don't think it ever quite made him happy. He took, of course, Barbara Hutton back to visit his mother, Elsie. His father had died in 1935, but his mother was still alive. In fact, she lived until nearly 96, two weeks before her 96th birthday. Uh, when he rang me up one time when I was doing the book, he said, you're only writing about me because you think I'm going to die. 
and this is about 75. I said, I think you're going to live as long as your mother. No trouble about it. And uh, he said, oh, gee, and, yeah, in that voice. When he first started in America, they thought he was Australian. They used to call him kangaroo when he was in the opera. <laughs> so he had to change his voice. He changed everything, you know, but this was still this incandescent. But there was a man in his life, about to come into his life, who, who changed all that perfect zany into something quite different. Alfred Hitchcock put him in a movie with Jane, Joan Fontaine, whom he'd borrowed from Selznick for this movie. Grant plays a con man and he fixes upon an heiress, rather a plain heiress, played by Joan Fontaine. Well, I'll tell you the ending after you've seen a little bit of it. It's called Suspicion. trying to do? Kill you? Nothing less than murder could justify such violent self-defense. Look at you. Let me go. Oh, I'm just beginning to understand. You thought I was going to kiss you, didn't you? Weren't you? Of course not. I was merely reaching around you, trying to fix your hair. What's wrong with my hair? Well, I'm glad you asked me that. It would have been extremely discourteous for me to bring the subject up. Are you serious? Well, of course I'm serious. I may seem provincial, but frankly, I... I can't understand men like you. You always give me the feeling that you're laughing at me. No, I give you my word. But your hair's all wrong. But it had such wonderful possibilities that I... Well, I got excited. For the moment, I became a, a passionate hairdresser. What's wrong with it? Let me show you. Let me see. That? Don't do that. Why not? Because your usipital mapillary is quite beautiful. What's an usipital mapillary? Hmm? That. You don't need to touch it. That's it. Mm, that's good. Mm -hmm. yeah. It must be quite a novelty by contrast with the women that you're photographed with. What do you think of me by uh, contrast to your horse? I think if I ever got the bit between your teeth, I'd have no trouble in handling you at all. I suppose just you thought you had me under control, I turned around, neighed, and kissed you. I think you've done enough fooling with my hair. You don't look very good like that. You look more like a monkey with a bit of mirror. What does your family call you, monkey face? I still think my way was best. I must go now. I'll be late to luncheon. Anyway, if my father saw me come in both late and beautiful, he might have a stroke. I don't think he was ever better. Uh, frightening, but a wonderful. The end of the movie, Grant, according to Hitchcock's script, poisons Joan Fontaine with a glass of milk which he carries upstairs to her bedroom. She writes a letter to her mother, who of course was right all along. The family said, "Don't, for goodness sake, don't trust him. Uh, saying, I don't want to live anymore. I know he's going to kill me. She leaves the letter by the bedside. He gives her the milk. She drinks the milk and she says to him, will you post the letter? The kind hearts and coronets ending for those film buffs among us. Um, he, of course, posts the letter. RKO, the studio, wouldn't have it. They would not have Cary Grant play a murderer. They changed the ending. And ruined a film that could have been quite wonderful. In fact, Joan Fontaine was the only person Hitchcock ever won an Oscar for. She won an Oscar for Suspicion. Grant never won an Oscar for a performance. 
one of the most extraordinary things in Hollywood history, we'll, we'll do two more just to prove how extraordinary it is. For all his success and for all his admiration, the Academy never, ever once awarded him an Oscar. He was given an honorary Oscar in 1970 for his general contribution, but he wasn't given an, an Oscar for a single performance. And I would have thought, for example, that performance amply, amply justified it. But what Hitchcock had discovered was the dark side to Grant. He, he, he discovered that he was a man who, yes, he did have his wife, and that still at the same time, Carey was struggling with his wives. You know, Barbara Hutton had, had had this huge house, and she had six staff, and she invited people to the supper every night, and, and he only wanted to come back from the studio and put his feet up and watch television, or the early days of television. No, no, she was entertaining. And this went on and on, and he got more and more angry, and, you know, Luella Parsons christened them Cash and Carey. Um, you know, it, was, it, it wasn't a happy time. And in the end, she moved out, and then he moved, they had reconciliation, and then she moved out again, and he loved the boy, but it, it was just a disaster. But still, when he went to the studio, he made extraordinary films. I'd just like to show you one tiny bit of one at this time. This time again with Howard Hawks, a remake of the the front page, the famous play and film. And in this one, the parts are slightly changed. Grant plays the editor. And Rosalind Russell, the part had been offered to everybody, including Joan Fontaine, incidentally, uh, plays the reporter, Hildy Johnson. She's his ex-wife. We're back in the ex-wives again, OK? Who's actually going to marry Ralph Bellamy, except everybody in the audience knows she's not really going to marry Ralph Bellamy. Whoever marries Ralph Bellamy? No one ever married Ralph Bellamy. Um, certainly not in the movies, anyway. Um, but, so she's... And these two are conniving. He's the editor, she's the, you know, the ace reporter, and they've got the killer, Earl Williams, hidden in a desk in the press room. Two things. This movie allowed something called overlapping dialogue, which Robert Altman then went on to do in MASH, and a lot of people claimed credit for it later. This was the first time it was really ever properly used. And at some points, I'm afraid not this particular bit, Grant was so astonished, he looked at the camera and said, are you going to allow her to get away with that? Which is still in the cut of the film. However, this is not quite that bit. This is uh, His Girl Friday. Oh, let go of me. Where do you think you're going? I'm going after Mother and I'm going to get Bruce out of jail. Walter, why did you have to do this to me? Get Bruce out of jail? How can you worry about a man who's resting in a nice, quiet police station while this is going on? Hildy, this is war. You can't deserve me oh, now. Oh, Walter, will you get off that trapeze? You've got your story right over there on the desk. Go on, smear it all over the front page. Earl Williams captured by the Morning Post. I covered your story for you and I got in a fine mess doing it. Now I'm getting out. You drooling idiot. What do you mean? I just what I said. There are 365 days in a year one can get mad. How many times you got a murderer locked up in a desk once in a lifetime? Hildy, you got the whole city by the seat of the pants. Sure, I know, I know. You I... know, you know. You got the brain of a pancake. This isn't just a story you're covering. It's a revolution. This is the greatest yarn in journalism since Livingston discovered Stanley. It's the other way around. Oh, well, don't get technical at a time like this. You realize what you've done, honey. You've taken a city that's been graft ridden for 40 years under the same old gang. And with this yarn, you're kicking him out. You're giving us a chance to have the same kind of government New York's having under the Guardia. Listen, honey, if I didn't have your best interest at heart, you think I'd waste my time arguing with you? You've done something big, Hilda. You stepped up into a new class. Huh? We'll make such monkeys out of those ward healers next Tuesday. Nobody will vote for them, not even their wives. Expose them, eh? Certainly. We'll crucify that mob. We'll keep Williams undercover until morning so the Post can break the story exclusive. Then we'll let the governor in on the capture. Share the glory with him. I get him. it. I get it. You kicked over the whole city hall like an apricot. You got the mayor and Hartwell backed up against the wall. You put one administration out and another one in. This isn't just a newspaper story, Hildy. It's a career. And you stand there belly aching about whether you catch an 8 o'clock train or a 9 o'clock train. Well, I never figured oh, it that way. Oh, you're still a doll-faced hick, that's why. Gee, we'd be the white-haired boy. Sure, they'll be naming streets after you. Hildy Johnson Street. There'll be statues of you in the park. The movies will be after you. The radio. By tomorrow morning, I'll bet you there's a Hildy Johnson cigar. You can see the billboards now. It says, light up with Hildy Johnson. Oh, Walter, will you stop that acting? Huh? we got a lot to do. Oh, you're talking. We can't leave Williams in here. We'll take him over to my private office. Which is our phone? That one on the end. Oh. How are you going to take him to see him? Not if he's inside the desk. We'll carry the desk over. Hello. You can't move that desk. It's crawling with cops outside. All right, we're lowered out the window with pulleys. Now quit stalling. Get the typewriter over here. Come on, stop pounding out of leaves. How much of this stuff do you want? All the words you got. Hello, give me Duffy. Hey, what? Can I call the mayor a bird of prey? Call him anything you like. How about the time he had his house painted by the fire department? Give him the word. Uh -huh. Hello, Duffy, get set. We got the biggest story in years. Earl Williams captured by the Morning Post exclusive. Yeah. And I want you to tear out the whole front page. That's what I said, the whole front page out. I never mind the European war. We got something a whole lot bigger than that. Hildy Johnson's right in the lead. I'll give it to you as soon as she's finished. 
And listen, Duffy, get hold of Butch O'Connor. Time to come up here right away with half a dozen of his wrestlers. Yeah, Butch O'Connor. That, of course, is Ralph Bellamy. <laughs> a man deeply out of his depth, as he was in the awful truth as well. His girl Friday, you could call the epitome of Grant at his absolute best. Um, I fear that as the 40s went on, he wanted to make films that were more serious. He went on to make Arsenic Old Lace rather unhappily for Frank Capra and said afterwards Jimmy Stewart would have done it better. He went, made none but The Lonely Heart with his friend Clifford Odets, who replaced Randy Scott as one of his real companions in an attempt to win an Oscar and didn't. He took a year off and then made Night and Day a biopic of Cole Porter. And around this time he met what the woman who became his third wife, Betsy Drake, who, believe it or not, is still alive, living in Hampstead. I don't think she's here tonight. Um, uh, Betsy Drake was an actress. He saw her in London. He'd come for a trip. He went, saw her on the Olympic, uh, not the Olympic, on the uh, Queen Mary, going back to America with Freddie Lonsdale, the playwright, one of his friends. And they became a couple. Um, she had many qualities. Uh, but one of them wasn't particularly acting, although they did make some movies together, including Every Bride Should Be Married, and Mr. Blanding's Builds His Dream House. But she also introduced him to all kinds of psychotherapy, including uh, experiments with what was then legal but now isn't, uh, the psychotic drug LSD, uh, which was administered by a man called Mortimer Hartman. And during writing my first book, I found Mortimer Hartman in a rather flea-bitten hotel in New York, and I asked him what on earth possessed him to give Grant these two-hour sessions, you know. And he, oh, well, it's freed his mind. To be fair to Grant, he actually said it did. He, you know, thought it was a, a help. I, I found that very, very difficult to understand and very difficult to really appreciate. But what, it is, what is true is that Betsy Drake brought him a sort of peace. He effectively retired. He said, oh, I'm not going to act, I'm going to give up, you know, I make little things now and again. I'm a male war bride with Howard Hawks, but really it was the career was going. And by the time I got to 52, he married Betsy Drake, and I'm not going to make take him. It was Hitchcock who got him back. He said, I've got a fantastic piece for you. I said, it's going to be set in the French Riviera, Kerry Light, glamour. Uh, and you're going to get to co-star with Grace Kelly, who had just won an Oscar for The Country Wife, not playing a glamorous woman, playing, in fact, a drunk, or the wife of a drunk. Um, and it's going to be wonderful. And Grant took one look at the script, which is superb, and said, OK, I think if there's one movie I want to end on tonight, it's this one. He plays a retired cat burglar called John Roby, whom Grace Kelly believes is gone back to his old ways and is stealing. I've never seen Grace Kelly better, and I've never seen Grant quite as wonderfully underplayed. The film, of course, is called To Catch a Thief. Bonsoir, madame. Bonsoir. If you really want to see fireworks, it's better with the lights out. I have a feeling that tonight you're going to see one of the Riviera's most fascinating sights. I was talking about the fireworks. I never doubted it. The way you looked at my necklace, I didn't know. I've been dying to say something about it all evening. Go ahead. Why, about me staring at it? No, you've been trying to avoid it. May I have a brandy? Please. Will you care for one? No, thank you. Some nights a person doesn't need to drink. Doesn't it make you nervous to be in the same room with thousands of dollars worth of diamonds and unable to touch them? No. Like an alcoholic outside of a bar on election day. <laughs> Wouldn't know the feeling. All right. You've studied the layout. Drawn your plans, worked out your timetable, put on your dark clothes with your crepe sole shoes and your rope. Maybe your face blackened. And you're over the roofs in the darkness, down the side wall to the right apartment. And the window's locked. 
All that elation turned into frustration. What would you do? I'd go home, get a good night's sleep. Oh, what would you do? The thrill is right there in front of you, but you can't quite get it. In the gems glistening on the other side of the window. And someone asleep, breathing heavily. I'd go home, get a good night's sleep. Wouldn't you use a glass cutter, a brick, your fist, anything to get what you wanted? Knowing it was just there waiting for you. Drinking dulls your senses. Yeah, and if I'm lucky, some of my hearing. Blue white, with just hair like touches of platinum. You know, I have about the same interest in jewelry that I have in politics, horse racing, modern poetry, or women who need weird excitement. None. Hold this necklace in your hand and tell me you're not John Roby the cat. John, tell me something. You're going to rob that villa we cased this afternoon, aren't you? Oh, I suppose rob is archaic. You'd say, knock over? Oh. Don't worry, I'm very good at secrets. Tell me, have you ever been on a psychiatrist's couch? Don't change the subject. I know the perfect time to do it. Next week, the Sanfords are holding their annual gala. Everyone who counts will be there. I'll get you an invitation. It's an 18th century costume affair. There'll be thousands upon thousands of dollars worth of the world's most elegant jewelry. Some of the guests will be staying for the weekend. We'll get all the information and we'll do it together. What do you say? My only comment would be highly censorable. Give up, John. Admit who you are. Even in this light, I can tell where your eyes are looking. you can't resist. Then tell me you don't know what I'm talking about. As long as you're satisfied. You know as well as I do, this necklace is imitation. Well, I'm not. Hitchcock, uh, you know, didn't hold back on the, uh, uh, how can one put it, the fireworks. Uh, in fact, um, Grant really only made a handful of more films. He went on to make The Gun, or it was called The Pride and the Passion, um, with Sophia Loren, whom he fell in love with, much to Betsy Drake's disappointment. Um, he then made Houseboat with Sophia Loren, which includes a wedding. I don't know if anybody remembers the movie, but in fact includes a wedding when Loren and Grant got married. And that very day, she got married by proxy to Carlo Ponte, whom, of course, she remained married to. Um, Betsy Drake exited stage left, um, rapidly uh, replaced by Diane Cannon. Um, who um, he saw on a television show called Malibu Run, then rang her agent and said uh, he'd really like to meet her. It really does take your breath away. I mean, there's a man truly sad. Um, uh, they had a daughter um, called Jennifer, who was born in 19... She's 46 now, so... Um, Diane Cannon, I'm afraid, too, didn't last and was replaced by the lady I met him with in the 70s, after he'd retired. Um, he turned down countless, countless incredible roles, asking him to come back, asking him to replay. But I think he felt that what you've seen this evening was, that was Cary Grant. He didn't want to appear as an old Cary Grant, he didn't want to appear as an ageing Cary. It wasn't like Spencer Tracy, 
He wasn't like Jimmy Stewart. He wasn't prepared to do that. That's not what he did. And he wanted to preserve this incandescent image. I think John Roby is an absolutely perfect example. I think North by Northwest is very good, but it's not anywhere near as good as To Catch a Thief. And he essentially retired, became a recluse, really. He lived with Barbara Harris in, uh, in the house that Howard Hughes bequeathed to him in Bellagio Road, 12 acres of ground. Um, a vaguely happy man, still uncertain about his own sexuality. He had a brief relationship with a British girl called Maureen Donaldson, from a daughter of a Muswell Hill fireman. But still uncertain. Turned down $5 million to write his autobiography. In the 80s, he went out on a series of lecture tours. An evening with Cary Grant, he got the audience, he didn't do anything, the audience just asked him questions and it was, you know, um, it was Barbara Harris, in fact, who encouraged him to do it. And it was on, in one of those uh, occasions, uh, that he had a heart attack um, and died in a, 1986, in November 1986, at the age of 82. Um, uh, for my money, I think the AFI were right. I think he was simply one of the great movie stars. I uh, compare him today, I suppose he's, you know, he's the George Clooney of his day, if you like. Um, but I think there was a great deal to him. And I hope I've given you a little indication of that. And, and Michael's told me very sternly that I can only have a couple of questions. So, come on, we've got a minute or two to go. Ma'am. Was he in England? No, no, he was in uh, Nebraska. Yes, he wasn't in England. I'm so sorry, I was asked, was he in England when he died? I'm so sorry, I should have repeated the question. So, anybody else? I'm, 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 at, I'm at, gone in a minute, those of you rushing for the entrance. <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very, very much. Jeffrey, that was fantastic. And one from me, did he actually play the piano? No. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Oh, okay. Well, folks, uh, just in closing, it's been a real delight to welcome you here to the Barnards Inn Cinema. Uh, it's been a fantastic showing, uh, and I really think we've been delighted to see Black and White and the Golden Era both at the same time. Uh, Jeffrey promised us that, like Archibald Leach, uh, we would meet Cary Grant at some points, and I think he's certainly delivered. And I understand that uh, he, Jeffrey's kindly uh, volunteers to stay behind a few minutes for those of you who've got some direct questions. But in typical Gresham tradition, uh, may I thank all the staff at Gresham College, David Vermont for making this possible, but most especially Jeffrey Wansel for a most delightful lecture. Thank you, Jeffrey. For all information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.